Hello and welcome to the show that still has no name. It is the interview before Red Tie Live's stream. So I'm here with Nick from Suburban Hypocrites. Nick, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. Could you propose a name for the show? Because we really got to nail this down at some point. Oh, shit. Uh, the pre prerequisite interview. Oh, I like it. Yeah. To make sure I'm qualified to play next weekend. Perfect. All Perfect. right. Let's see if you pass the test. <laughs> <laughs> Your band, The Suburban Hypocrites, you guys have three full-length albums out. You guys have been playing together since about 2014-ish, sound right? Yeah, I want to say we've probably formed like late 2013, early 2014, somewhere around there. So you guys have been playing together for quite a few years already, and you've had a little bit of a lineup change. So tell us where the band is at right now. Yeah, so when we started, it was a three-piece. Um, we had Travis on drums, who's currently still on drums, Lucas on bass, myself on guitar and vocals. Then we got Taras into the fold. Um, he was on guitar, so I went to primarily just vocals. And he stuck with us till, I want to say, early 2020. He mm -hmm. decided to leave the band. Um, so at that point, the original plan was for me to move back to guitar. And we quickly realized that that wasn't going to work. It's not where your skill set um, was. No, Taras is a great <laughs> guitarist, and there was no way I could fill those shoes. Um, so then Lucas kind of had the idea that he was going to jump over to guitar. Um, so I ended up taking his spot as the bassist. So final lineup right now is myself on vocals and bass, Lucas on guitar, and Travis on drums. Nice. Um, so your bio on your band camp says, uh, fast, sloppy punk rock, which I love the sound of that. Um, and to me, listening to, to your stuff, it like gives me those vibes of like that early 80s punk rock, right? Like more, yeah. more DC, more LA, certainly not like, I don't think anyone's gonna accuse you of being a melodic band. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, we definitely take a lot of influences from like Black Flag, Dead Kennedys, like more of the classic punk. Nice. Um, and so can you tell me a little bit about what it's like to write those like sort of stereotypically punk rock songs, they're really short, really fast, like so many of your songs are under two minutes long. I think that's just kind of we uh, something we pride ourselves on. Like we don't like to linger on certain ideas a lot. It's more so like, okay, if this is a cool riff, like we'll jam it out and then realize if it carries on too long, it's like, okay, well this just gets repetitive. And instead of having to like, you know, some bands will do like, like the Ramones for instance, were notorious for they just basically repeat the song twice to yeah. lengthen it out. And I'm kind of like, well, if someone really wants to hear it twice, they can just play the song twice. I heard <laughs> uh, an interesting tidbit about the song Salvation by Rancid uh, a couple of weeks back. And apparently that's the same thing. They're like, we had this tiny bit of a song and basically we just put it back to back, when they cut it back to back and that's how it is yeah. the way it is And I, I would rather the songs come across more than a thought than like a full calculated idea because that's just kind of like my writing style, like with lyrics and stuff. It's not really like I go super in depth about subjects. I kind of like to be all over the place. That's so that, very cool. that allows me to do that, having short songs. Yeah, I like that. And it allows you to get to the point, right? And then you can yeah. get on to the next thing. Exactly. You were talking about Travis, who is your drummer, mm -hmm. and uh, I heard in another interview that um, your bandmates live in a house that has a studio, and that's where you guys do a lot of recording. Can you tell us a little bit about what's, what that's like and, and how it all comes together? Because Travis ends up doing a lot of the mixing and mastering and stuff too, right? Yeah, it's um, it's definitely handy. Like We pride ourselves on being a DIY band, so we try to do as much of our own stuff as possible, um, Like as far as recording, doing merch, even like the artwork and stuff I all design. Um, but from the recording standpoint, yeah, Travis and Lucas live together. Um, the basement of their house has been converted to a studio. So we jam there, demo there, as well as record our albums there. And then Travis does all the mixing, mastering, um, which is great, but also a little bit of a curse too, because he tends to linger on things way longer than he should have and like beat himself up where what? he'll be, you know, in like the third draft of a mix. And I'm like, okay, man, it's good. Like it's ready yeah. to go. And then next thing you know, we're on like the 10th draft of the mix. And I'm like, I don't even know what you're changing anymore. Yeah, I can't even hear it. <laughs> so, I mean, from that aspect, I think things take a little bit longer and drag out a little bit longer, but it is nice at the end of the day to know, like we did this whole thing ourselves. Literal full creative control. Yeah, yeah. That's very cool. And did that um, come in handy during the last two years where everything was shut down and you couldn't go places? Absolutely. Um, this last album was definitely weird because the two before that, it was more like the whole band was always hanging out in the studio and partying. And it was mm -hmm. kind of like, you could tell on the record um, that we were all partying while we were recording it. Whereas this time around with the most recent album, it was more like when we can do it, we would do it. Um, they obviously lived together, so they were able to get all the drum tracking done mm -hmm. and Lucas could do all the scratch guitars. And then when it was 
um, like public health orders would allow it, I could go down and do say my bass. And then once all that was mixed together, I could go do vocals. So it was really kind of spread out uh, over the course of an entire year versus like cracking it out in a weekend or two weekends kind of thing. Um, so in going over some of your old song titles and uh, some social media posts, what's your beef with the MLCC? Rooting everybody's fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have as much beef with them anymore because mm. I'm like coming up on three years of sobriety from alcohol. Thank you. Um, but yeah, back in the day, and I mean, still now, I still feel like they're pretty overbearing with certain things and people should have a lot more freedoms with what they want to do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it, it was more so just a childish uh, childish beef little, with Little tongue in cheek, little jab. Yeah. Um, so I think this, this is a great opportunity to talk a little bit about your sobriety because you said you can hear it in your older records, right? Where you guys were hanging out and yeah. the way that came through on recording. And then um, I know I, I was listening to another interview where you're talking about the album cover for the new record and it's a picture of your ceiling. Yeah. Um, so that you spend a lot of time kind of contemplating and I'm assuming that ties into your experience with sobriety a little bit too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here smiling about it now because it's... Because you're on the other to, side of it. Yeah, on the other side of it. But um, for sure, it was tough to get through. And uh, the album title, obviously, A Figment of Your Inebriation, is kind of a play on words of a figment of your imagination. Mm -hmm. And I think right around when I was at my worst, it was a lot of, you know, mixing alcohol and prescription drugs together and a lot of the delusions and other things that come along with that that I was feeling. That's when I wrote a lot of those lyrics. Um, and the, yeah, the significance of the cover of the album, like you said, is the ceiling above my bed that I obviously just altered in Photoshop, but I spent probably the f good chunk of the first year of the pandemic, just kind of laying there staring at the ceiling being like, what do I do? And, and it just kind of reflects in all the songs for sure. I think that's super relatable. Cause I feel like we've all been in that position at some point over yeah, the last absolutely. few months. Um, now your newest record, which uh, came out late last year, Figment of Your Inebriation, like you said, it sounds very different from yeah. the stuff that you guys put out. Does that have to do with, well, probably the change in lineup, obviously, and then the change in um, instruments that you've been playing. Um, but also, did you find that like your sobriety helped in some ways, um, like with the recording or with your writing process? I think I've definitely become more jaded about things. And yeah. it's a lot more of like a angry album than kind of like poking fun at everything. I mean, there's still a lot of tongue in cheek humor in there. Like I've still been able to uh, retain that part of my personality but for the most part yeah it's it's a lot more focused and a lot more serious and a lot more about personal issues versus things that make me laugh okay oh well, that, that totally makes sense um so you have a record label yeah record label cassette label what's I, yeah i wouldn't it labels a loose term for okay. sure it's more <laughs> so um i just wanted the ability to have creative control of putting my band's albums out and distributing them and also being able to like if my friends bands have albums that they want to get out there and don't know which way to go i can help them with that and put it out um yeah we mainly do cassettes just because it's kind of a niche um not genre format i guess would be the right word um but we also do like vinyl cds a little bit of everything. It's called Frozen Hell, if you want to check it out. Um, let's talk a little bit about the sort of uh, resurgence of cassettes, because I think that's really interesting. And I think that in the punk genre in particular, um, like I used to go to shows at the West End and that, that was it, right? You'd, you'd sift through the tapes. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that resurgence and, and why you think it's a good fit. I just think cassettes are really cool. I mean, CDs, they're great. You can scratch them, you know, cassettes. They're analog, first of all. I'm a big analog media guy. I like having the little, you know, case that flips mm -hmm. open. Like, it just looks cool to me. It's more of an aesthetic thing. Like, obviously, the sound quality isn't as good as a CD. But to me, it's just cool having, you know, the little cassette. Yeah. Sorry, that's not as detailed of an no. answer as I'm sure you wanted to get from me. But, yeah, it doesn't really go any farther than that. I that's just really okay. Like no, you just like it. Yeah. But sometimes people just like things, right? That's <laughs> yeah. allowed. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the plans for the future with the band. I know we're going to be doing the live stream next week. I know you've got something in the hopper that we can't really talk about yet. Yeah. But other than that, what are you guys looking forward to? Or what have you been doing these first couple months of 2022? Well, I'm hoping to get us back out on the road this summer. Um, it's kind of just at this point at a standstill where I've just given up on trying to book anything right Cause, now. Cause because why? it's right? Well, if there's no guarantees. With my other band, it's like, I think 
probably 10 or 15 different things have been put by the wayside mm. that they're like slowly coming back up. So it's like getting overloaded with that. Okay. Whereas I'm like, I don't want to throw another thing onto this band now. Yeah. And now it's like, we're trying to make up three tours and other bands trying to make up three tours. So, um, just still got my foot on the brake pedal a little bit on that one, but hoping for the best to have us, you know, at least do Western Canada this summer again. That would be so nice. Yeah. And just having something to look forward to, I think is super important. Oh, I love touring too. Like yeah. it's just so much fun getting to see, you know, the country and meet new people and just hang out with your buddies. It's basically like, we just view it as a vacation. And if it's a longer tour, we'll take days off to, you know, like go to West Edmonton Mall or do nice. do touristy shit like that. Why not? Yeah. Right? Why not? And there's something I think really cool about visiting legendary venues in other cities, right? Like Absolutely. you know the venues in your city where you went to shows growing up or whatever, but to be able to visit ones that you've heard about in other cities, I think there's something really special about that too. Yeah, absolutely. I think actually one of my favorite venues we've ever played was uh, called the SBC in Vancouver. Okay. Um, the Smiling Buddha Club, and it was on East Hastings. So <laughs> not not, the, not the greatest part of yeah. town, but it was actually. Uh, it was a little dive bar and it was essentially just a massive half pipe with a stage at the end of it. That sounds wild. So there wasn't really a lot of people skating while we were playing, but there was a lot of drunk people like doing somersaults down <laughs> and stuff. So, and it was, I just remember it was a super chaotic show. Like I think Trav's snare stand fell apart like halfway through the set and I turned around and he was like trying to drum with one hand holding his <laughs> snare up. So then we like had to stop to like get another snare stand or... I don't know. Actually, I don't remember if we fixed his or if we got another stand, but either way, we had to stop for like five or 10 minutes. So I was like just kind of messing with the crowd and it was actually super fun. I like when stuff like that happens. It's, well, that's the kind of stuff you remember most, right? Yeah. Like, and I mean, some bands freeze up and they're like, oh no, what do we do? We just kind of have the ability to laugh at ourselves and keep going. Awesome. Well, I'm super looking forward to your performance uh, next week. You can tune in on Facebook at 4 p.m. That's February 19th. So you're more from Suburb Suburban Hypocrites. Uh, where can people find your stuff? Um, generally on Bandcamp. We're also on, you know, Apple Music, uh, Spotify, basically any music streaming services. We're up there. Awesome. I'm going to go have another listen this afternoon. Right on. And, uh, yeah, look forward to hearing you guys do it in person next week. Thank you. Now that I'm gone and a whole you choose to burn. These thoughts in my mind